want to welcome longtime and personal friend Bet, Brett Barfield to the show today. He's a Georgia, Georgia insider, excuse me, and get his feel for what's going on in UGA. What's going on, Brett? How's going, Cody? Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, no problem. I guess first things first, um, the story, in my opinion, of this game would be Florida's offense versus UGA's defense. Uh, what's your – your take on that? Absolutely. I think uh, so. Over the last several years, in matchups where you've had high-powered defenses versus great, um, or sorry, high-powered offenses versus great defenses, um, there's a statistic that's out there, um, and it's mostly been a national championship game or big games where you've had number one defense versus number one offense. But the defense has been five and zero in those matchups. I know this isn't a number one defense and a number one offense matchup statistically, but they're both right up there. Um, and tops in the nation in their own respective categories. So defense have been 5-0 and in that statistic. They've won those games. Since last year, they're 0-2, the defense is, to offenses. So we may be seeing a shift here um, in a new era of college football where offense is king and it's no longer defenses that wins championships. You're saying Georgia's 0-2 against the high-powered offenses? Uh don't think – yeah, actually, it is the Georgia defense that went up against – it was Georgia that went up against LSU, and then Georgia went up against Alabama. And at both times, it was the number one offense versus number one defense. And uh, the defense offense prevailed, both, huh? The offense won both of those games. And that was a trade that uh, over the last several years, defense had won 5-0. and That's interesting. Even Alabama is kind of shifting to – an offensive team, and they've always been known for great defense. And Nick Saban's acknowledged it. Nick Saban has acknowledged it over the last couple of weeks that it's an offensive league now. Adapt or die, I guess. Uh, what is, what's your take on Georgia's offense? What needs to be fixed? Is that personnel? Is that coaching? Is it scheme? Is it what could it be? Yeah, I think they need to come in and they need to – it started with last recruiting cycle. He's getting some more receivers in there, some more talented receivers, some guys that can – you know, we can spread out and we can get them out there on the edge and they can make plays. I think now it's just going to get Todd Munkin's system, get it in there, get it implemented, get the guys used to it, get the receivers some time to get used to the new routes and the learning everything. And then a quarterback is the big thing. I think right now from what we've seen with the decision-making at that position, there's obviously not a guy there. Um, that's the guy that's going to come in and be a star. Um, there's just a guy there that's going to fill that role and hopefully not make a bunch of mistakes and can distribute the ball. But yep. until they can get a quarterback, um, I think they have the pieces everywhere else. Offensive line's good. Running backs are good. Receivers are there. And that leads us right into our next topic, actually, the quarterback situation at Georgia. And there's no doubt you guys – aren't lacking any talent. I mean, you guys have recruited a five-star quarterback, it seems like, almost every year, or at least a high four-star. Um, there's guys there. Is it just because they're young and they're not ready to step into the spotlight, you think? Or is Kirby making the right call with Stetson Bennett? What is? What do you think? Difficult, man. It's difficult. Because a lot of that, you know, you, you want to be there. You want to be able to see what the coaches are seeing and – and uh, I think given the year and, and what they've had, to, they haven't had much time that they normally do to look at everybody. But from what I understood, going into this, Stinson Bennett was told he was the fourth string quarterback. Yeah. He was given that announcement from Kirby himself, and he even said it. And he said, you know, that kind of bummed him out. So quickly he thrusted up the depth chart for whatever reason and did come in and gave a, a boost in the Missouri game – or sorry, in the Arkansas game and then looked well. Looked pretty decent in the Tennessee game, in the Auburn game. Um, first half of the Alabama game was pretty good. Um, yeah. But I just wonder about JT. I think JT, I've watched the tape on him. I've seen him play. The guy's got great arm talent. Every now and then when the pocket breaks down, he's made questionable decisions. But um, coaching, you can help coach him up and, and, and get that better. I just wonder if his health is a big issue and why we're not seeing JT and I think uh, Dewan having the issues that he had, the brain surgery, and coming back from that, um, you know, I, I don't know if we were going to see Dewan this year either, but he came in and – That brings up another point, though. I'm glad you said that. Uh, Dewan got some snaps in that first game and didn't play too well, and it seems like Kirby just 
pulled the rug out from under him and didn't really give him another shot thereafter. It was Stetson Bennett's job from then on. Yeah, he played a couple uh, cleanup snaps and a couple uh, and one game. I don't remember which one it was, but other than that, yeah, we haven't seen Dewan. I figured he'd maybe try to mix it in a little bit and give Dewan maybe a drive in the first half or something like that. But um, it seems that he's going to stick with Bennett at this point in time. He was asked about it before the game on Saturday. He said Bennett's the guy. There's no questions. He was asked about it after the game. Uh, Bennett threw two more picks. Uh, Kirby alluded to the fact that he didn't feel like those picks were directly because Bennett made the wrong, the wrong decision or he made bad mistakes, bad reads. Um, so it seems like he's going to stick with Bennett and that's going to be our guy unless something, unless something crazy happens. Do you think Kirby favors these game managing type quarterbacks as opposed to a – Another style, say, you know, a big threat quarterback, a big arm, uh, whatever you call it. Do you think he favors that type of quarterback? Definitely. I believe he favors a game manager. Um, he talks about it a lot, so I could only assume that that's what, that's what he's looking for. That's what he likes, it seems to be. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, if we lose to Florida or if we, uh, we trip up somewhere down the road, I think he's going to have to make a decision. Um, sometime this season or when the season is over, at least the quarterbacks that we'll have in that quarterback room, if Brock Vandergriff stays, JT will be there. And then you'll have Dewan Mathis. Brock Vandergriff is a great dual threat quarterback, so he can move around and he's got a big arm. So, uh, and Carson Beck will still be there. So I think next year, if he doesn't make the right decision at the quarterback position, or at least the fans don't feel like he does, and the season kind of goes astray, uh, could be some uh, tough sledding for Kirby. Yeah, I know a lot of fans. A lot of fans, I guess, uh, not your so avid fans or knowledgeable fans are already calling for Kirby's head. I think that's silly. But uh, I remember talking to you in the summer, and you weren't too worried about there not being a spring and a limited fall practice. But I guess it's amazing how quickly that can change when, uh, in this case, when Jamie Newman chose to opt out. That was big. That was big. But, again, it, we say it's big, but we don't know what Jamie Newman is going to be. We know what he was hyped up to be. Mm-hmm. We know that he was hyped up to be some touted quarterback who's going to come in here and, and play God and Heisman Trophy candidate and, and all these things. But Jamie Newman left for a reason, whether it be COVID-19, whether it be like he felt like during the practices that he wasn't going to actually win the job and uh, and try right. to NFL draft, so he he left for whatever reason. Which, in my eyes, I think a lot of the guys that are opting out, that are projected to be certain picks, I think they're hurting themselves. You look at Mac Jones before the season started. I don't think Mac Jones from Alabama was on anybody's radar. He is right now torching what Joe Burrow did last year in touchdown passes and passing yards. Um, so he's thrusting himself to what could be a first-round draft pick for him. So I think those guys that opted out, they may drop. They may see their stack drop, their uh, draft stock drop. Because That's of exactly that. right. I was just about to say, I don't see an NFL team picking up Jamie Newman with no tape over, say, Trevor Lawrence. If he would have played, he could have proven himself. But I think there's a possibility maybe he realized he was overrated and took advantage of all that hype that he was getting and – Maybe NFL scouts got to him and said, look, you don't even need to play this season. Uh, Just sit out, save yourself from injury. And maybe he viewed that as an easy way out and where he didn't have to prove himself and just go make some quick, easy money. Maybe he wasn't the guy, like you said, and he wasn't getting the first team snaps. Who knows? I mean, I guess that's that's inside stuff that we wouldn't know, especially since they don't let anybody inside uh, practice this year due to COVID, right? Viewing time, I think it's very short, a lot shorter than what it normally is. Yep. Um. But what do you, what's your view? What is the fan base feeling as far as this season after the uh, events that have played out so far? What's everybody's expectations? Well, I can tell you, uh, this isn't from my point of view. This is just from what I've seen on social media and from most of the Georgia fans. Um, Nick Saban's Georgia's daddy. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, a, light, that's a light way of putting it. Uh, they, feel like, they feel like Kirby Smart is Mark Rick 2.0. Um, 
I don't necessarily feel all those ways. I think each Alabama game has had its own reason why it's went south. Um, some of it was Kirby. Some of it was decisions that were made uh, during the game, uh, fourth down, fake punt um, when the game's tied and you got a good defense uh, on their side of the field. But uh, I think the fan base is distraught. A lot of uh, – I think they're real critical. They're being real critical of a lot of things. I, and if to put it in perspective, I think they're spoiled. I think, right. Kirby, I think that Kirby came in his second year, success, go to the SEC championship game, you win, you're SEC champions, you go to the college football playoff, you beat the Heisman Trophy winner, go to the national championship game. And now the year after that, it seems like the expectations are national championship or bust every single year. But every single year, we've lost somebody. Mel Tucker, uh, Jim Chaney, um, Cooley. Uh, you know what I mean? It seems like every year with normal expectations – in college football in years past where you're going to have a year or maybe a year or two where you're not going to meet certain expectations because you need time to, to, you know, get acclimated to the system that these new coaches are bringing in new players. I mean, we had, we lost almost our whole offensive line last year. Yeah. And while we're talking about it, uh, go ahead and go over the, uh, it looks like that's going to happen again. Uh, Go ahead and go over the injury report with me uh, for the dogs and uh, who they could be missing out Saturday when they play Florida. Yeah, so we're definitely going to be without our senior captain and star All-American safety, Richard LeCount. Um, We're definitely going to be missing him. He's out, car accident, uh, late last night, getting back to the Athens from the Kentucky game. Um, They said it could have been a lot worse than what it was for LeCount. He uh, has some lacerations, some bruises, and uh, a shoulder issue that's going to keep him out a couple of weeks, not just this game. Um, and then at the Kentucky game, we ended up uh, losing Jordan Davis, who is a big 99. That's a big man up front on the uh, defensive line. Is he um, nose tackle? He is nose tackle. Um, he's, there, there's no update other than, you know, he missed uh, – he went out of the game and missed the whole second half. Um, and then his backup, Julian Rochester, who's a uh, fifth-year senior, Uh, Went down with a knee injury as well. There's no update on his status, no update on uh, if these guys are going to miss this weekend. Quay Walker was in the game because Monty Rice was dealing with some issues at linebacker. He went down with a neck issue, didn't return to the game. Lewis Seen, the other free safety back there with Richard LeCount that took over J.R. Reed's uh, position, Um, he was down with an ankle, didn't return. And then Tyreek Stevenson, the DB. He has an unknown injury uh, that he also had during the game. He'll be out. George Pickens as well, the uh, freshman phenom at receiver, the guy who had a lot of production, our leading receiver last year. Um, he's going to be a question for this game, and so is the uh, – sorry, it's either redshirt sophomore or freshman running back Kenny McIntosh, who's played punt return, kick return, and actually started a couple games at running back. Could be missing him as well. So it's a, it's a pretty long list of guys. Yeah, man, that's tough. Um, Florida's dealing with uh, people being out as well. Hopefully that changes, not necessarily due to injuries. Mullen doesn't specify whether it's injury-related or COVID. But I hate to see people go down like that. But, man, the fact that all those guys you just mentioned are mostly on the defensive side of the ball, you got to say that gives at Florida somewhat an advantage. Big advantage, uh, especially missing Richard LeCount and Lewis Seen. Um, I feel like most of those other positions, we have a guy that we could plug in there and there won't be as much of a drop-off uh, due to recruiting. We've recruited really well. And we've recruited well at those other positions. But I think those positions are a little bit harder to bring a guy in and expect uh, the, the kind of play that Richard LeCount does. LeCount's actually leading the SEC in interceptions this year. Um, that's a stat that I have found. Um you said interceptions? Yep. Oh, wow. He's actually, he's actually leading the league in uh, interceptions. I think he's tied with somebody else. He's uh, Is he the captain of y'all's defense? He is the defensive captain. <clears throat> also, real quick, I know this isn't news to Gator fans, but I just wanted to give the viewers an opportunity to hear it from a, a Georgia fan. And who has dealt with Todd Grant- Grantham personally? What is – what did third in Grantham mean at Georgia? And, like, I remember we were talking, I think it was, like, last season, you were telling me that 
not get too high on Grantham that Florida fans would get sick of him and we'd probably want to fire him after the second or third year. And it turns out you're absolutely right. I mean, he turned things around against Missouri and we looked good. Hopefully that continues, but who knows? That's why they play the games. But what did third and Grantham mean when he was at Georgia? Couldn't get off the field on third down. Um, whether it be blitzing, whether it be, you know, he was just too obvious on his play calls and, and teams picked up on it. But, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. We could not get off the field on third down. Teams were converting third down, keeping us on the field and extending drives. And every year we were told as Georgia fans that, you know, we had the talent on defense. The defense was going to be better next year. It's going to progress. It never really seemed to make that upward trajectory jump that it was supposed to make under him. It just kind of stayed where it was at. Kind of good, um, could be great, but if we could have got off the field on third down, we would have been a really good defense. But other than that, they would stay on the field, get tired, and third and Grantham came alive. <laughs> when he first got here, it was a uh, th- they used it as a good thing, third and Grantham. We were actually pretty, pretty solid on third down last season and the uh, prior year. Was that always the issue, or did that happen? as the years went on with Grantham, did he progressively get worse or was he just bad on third down from day one? No, uh, the reason why we ended up getting rid of him, uh, um, he progressively got worse. Uh, when he first got there, it was actually, you know, it was okay. It was acceptable. And then the second year came and it seemed to get worse. And the third year came and it seemed like it got worse again. So that's when I think it just got unacceptable, especially with the talented guys that he had on defense. There was really no excuse yeah, and that's he's a, good, he's a good defensive coordinator. Don't get me wrong; he's a yeah. good defensive coordinator. I just don't think, for whatever reason, he can be great. I don't know what it is. It almost uh, seems like he gets comfortable or something because uh, we were horrible at the beginning, the first three games, and now he gets challenged by Mullen, and the fan base is starting to talk and murmur a little bit. And now, yesterday. Missouri was three of 15 on third down, a complete turnaround from what the first three games showed. Um, so hopefully he can carry that out. But like I said, we'll, we'll have to keep that in mind. Uh, also, I know you wanted to talk a little bit on the history of the rivalry here. What you got for me on that? There's definitely a, a rich history here in this rivalry game. Um, there's a stat that jumps out. I hear I hear it talks about every year. Um, 13 consecutive games have been won by the team that rushes for more yards in this matchup. 13 of the last games played. If you rushed for more yards than I did, you won. Um, there's probably other stats we could look at like that and, and find streaks, but for whatever reason, that's the one that people seem to want to point to, and uh, they feel like that that's an important stat in this rivalry game and decides the game each and every year. I think turnovers could probably be just as important. But I also think, given that stat, you would first thing you would think of, uh, especially with Kyle Trask being y'all's leading rusher in last night's game, first thing you would think of is Georgia has the edge in that. Um, they got the running backs. Their running game looks better. Statistically, it's better. Mm-hmm. But I think we could see that streak broken this year. That's possible. Um, Yeah, it does look like that on paper. But also, if you look, coming into last night's game, I'm not sure what it's changed to, but coming into last night's game, we averaged 4.8 yards a toke, which is not bad by any means. We just are stronger at throwing the football, so we throw the ball a lot more than we tend to rush. So we're not a bad rushing team. We just don't really run the ball that much. Um. And also, to your point, that reminds me, the whole rushing yards, whoever wins the rushing battle, I believe that's true. How many years did you say that goes back? Years in a row. And I remember when Will Muschamp was the coach and you all were heavy favorites. I went into that game thinking there's no way we won. And somehow that's all we did. We rushed the ball very well on you guys and we ended up getting the upset. So I believe that is a very true stat, what you're bringing to my attention. Um, so, yeah, like, we'll see if that stays on the same path if that's gonna, or if that's going to trend the other direction. What the question is, is it's broken uh, this, this coming up Saturday. Say that, ag- say that again. Uh, y'all, you were breaking up a little bit. 
Uh, my prediction is is that streak will end this this coming up Saturday in Jacksonville. Uh, in a good way or a bad way? <laughs> uh, well, well, you'll find out here in a little bit. <laughs> but I think uh, I think passing yards are are gonna win this game. Well, I guess that takes us into the next segment. Um, what are the keys for the dogs in order to win this game? What do y'all have to do and do well? Sure. We have to control the line of scrimmage. We're going to have to be able to run the ball, which will then open up the passing game for Stinson Bennett. Those play action passes, it'll take some pressure off of him. If we're one dimensional, if Florida can come in and they're front seven and they can manhandle us up front and get pressure, I think it's going to make it really hard for us. The offense isn't great, but we're going to have to get some running game going to get some pressure off of Stinson Bennett and allow him to be able to pass the football because we're going to have to throw. Can't do what we did against Kentucky last week and just lean on our front and uh, score 14 points. It's not going to win in Jacksonville. I also think we have to take care of the football. We've had five turnovers in the last two games. We can't have uh, mistakes like that in this game. We can't give Florida any free chances on offense to go down the field. Possessions were limited in the Kentucky game. Um, we may get some more possessions in this game, but you never know how the game's going to go. So every possession, I think we need to take care of the football in this Florida game for sure. Uh, exactly. defense Defensively, though, missing the key guys that we were missing, I think they're going to have to get off the field on third down. They're going to have to help the offense out a little bit. Um, they're going to have to get off the field. They're going to have to make plays. There's going to be a lot of one-on-ones. Kyle Pitts is going to get some man coverage. He's going to be lined up on linebackers. Those guys are going to have to win some of those 50-50 balls and uh, get some pressure on Kyle Trask. You're exactly right. I think the magic number for you guys is somewhere around 24 if you guys can put up more than 24 points, I think you got a legitimate shot. Um, that defense of y'all's, I mean, I don't really see us scoring in the 30s and 40s against the Georgia defense. So if you can put up over 24 points, I think you guys have a legitimate shot. And coming into this game, my keys to victory were to be healthy. Um, we got a lot of guys out, but it kind of seems like that may just kind of wash after you told me the uh, – injury report on you guys so we might both have some guys out that kind of washes itself um but most importantly for florida can we get enough stops on defense to stay in the game um it was a great sign yesterday watching against missouri the turnaround but can they do that two weeks in a row that's the big question what's uh do you have any other keys yeah i think third down was big last year um i think if you go back and you look at the stats Georgia converted. Uh, we had our best game on third down last year against y'all. Call it third and Grantham. Call it what you want. But I think third downs are going to be a big key to this game on both sides of the football. Uh, Georgia's offense is going to need to convert, stay on the field so their defense doesn't get tired. The defense got tired in that Alabama game. When you're turning the football over and you're getting them right back on the field against a high-powered offense, that's going to move the football. Mm -hmm. They're going to make plays. Um, the offensive line for Florida has improved, so they're going to wear down that defensive line, especially a defensive line that's missing some key guys, could be missing some key guys. We don't know. We'll find out later in the week when Kirby gives an injury update. That'll be big. Uh, might even need a, a part two to this once we figure some more out later in the week. Right. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, I think that'll be a, a big key is third down for both teams. Can Florida keep their drive going? Can Georgia keep their drive going? And can these defenses get off the field? That's another thing. Ethan White has been injured all year. We haven't seen him play. Um, he's like our starting center. He's expected to uh, – well, he was expected to be back this week, but it didn't happen. Uh, if he does return, I think maybe we could attempt to take advantage of a couple of injuries on y'all's defensive front. That would be huge for Florida. What's your, uh, what's your prediction, your honest prediction, non-biased score prediction for this game? 35-17. Who? 35-17 Florida? Florida? Yep. Oof. Florida gets over the hump against the head coach. Dan Mullen has not won a football game against the Georgia Bulldogs. Um, I think he finally does that. Uh, coming into this week, um, I felt really good about the matchup. I felt like we were going to be able to neutralize some of the things that Florida did on offense. I feel like Kirby Smart has had good game plans coming into Jacksonville. We've played really well defensively, um, especially in years where I think it was either last year or the year before that. There was an 
issue with sacks. We were down at the bottom of the league in sacks, and people were talking about how our defense can't create any pressure. We got to Kyle Trask. We got sacks. I think we had three or four, and I think Florida didn't get any. Um, I think that changes this year. Missing the guys that we're missing on defense. Um, if we had LeCount, if we had, if we have Lewis Seen, um, if we end up only missing LeCount, then there's really no excuses. I feel like we should win the football game. But if we're missing all of those guys on defense, I feel like it's going to be really tough for us to come in and expect those young guys to to come out there and compete at a high level against probably one of the best offenses in the country. Yeah, Florida might also be missing our starting defensive end, Zach Carter. And Florida's defense has a way of making any quarterback look great this year, with the exception of Missouri. Um, so who knows, Stetson Bennett might surprise you against Florida. He could come in and just light it up, kind of like Fromm had his best year against or best game against Florida every year. And it's also, and go ahead. We need third and Grantham. He's going to need it. Yeah. <laughs> have it. When was it? Two years ago that we went to the to the game in Jacksonville, or was that last season? It was it was two years ago that we went? I went last year with Katrina. I remember uh, that two years ago the mood kind of shifted the same week of the game and Florida fans had a lot of momentum and hype coming into this game. And a lot of uh, analysts actually predicted Florida to win, but it didn't exactly play out like that. Um, So, I mean, that's why they play the games. I'll be tuning in and just as excited as ever. I think we have a good shot. I'm going to go with Florida 28, Georgia 21 as my score prediction. I think it'll be fairly close, closer Definitely a lot closer than your prediction, but I'm I'm looking forward to it, man. Yeah, me too. It's a rivalry game. It's one of the, the greatest rivalries, I believe, in college football um, as far as every year you go into this game and uh, there's some sort of impact in the college football landscape, whether it be SEC championship or whether it be college football playoff. Um, so this year it's going to be just as important. I think winner of this game runs to the table – and goes and meets a juggernaut in Atlanta. Do you think uh, either one of these teams could potentially keep up with Alabama? I think if Florida's defense, uh, if what we've seen last week uh, becomes, uh, you know, reality, if it's consistent and they come out there and they do that week in and week out for the rest of the season and continue to get better, I feel like offensively you have what it takes to play with the Clemsons, the Alabamas, the Georgias, um, Oklahoma's, whoever else you want to name, Notre Dame's. Y'all have the, the offensive talent to do it. Um, he's a great, great play caller, the head coach is Dan Mullen. Um, so I think if the defense improves, they get better, they get healthy. I think you got a shot in Atlanta, but you got to find somebody to cover uh, Devontae, man. That guy last night, even with Jalen Waddle out, he torched him. Oh, an interesting stat that you brought that up that I have – is on the Alabama receivers. As far as leading receivers in the country, Alabama's three receivers are in the top ten, and they have a third guy in there with Devontae. Uh, I forget his name, but that's an interesting stat. They got three receivers in the top ten in receiving yards. That's got to be some sort of record. (laughs) I don't know if that's ever happened before. (laughs) <laughs> and the running back is, is, is just, you know, another Derrick Henry, uh, another mm-hmm. just a big physical back who can just pound on you. And when you get late in those games, and you're already tired. Um, but it'll be interesting to see. I'll be pulling for the East personally. Um, I'm ready for the dynasty to fall. It's a little boring watching Alabama Clemson every year. So hopefully we can uh, – whoever prevails in Jacksonville can, uh, can get it together and head to Atlanta and give the East a victory. Yeah, and talk, speaking of Notre Dame, I honestly think they're overrated. Um, uh, College game day will be covering that game. They will not be in Jacksonville Saturday, unfortunately. Um, I guess I guess it is. You could argue that it's more of a marquee matchup. But I think – I don't know, man. This Florida, something about this Florida-Georgia rivalry, it just has all the implications of, you know, winner goes to Atlanta. It's such a huge game in my opinion. No, absolutely. I think those, those two games are, are going to have uh, huge implications on the college football playoff landscape. Um, I will be watching both of them for sure and interested to see what happens. Um, I wouldn't be mad if Notre Dame won, honestly. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll, I'll be pulling for Notre Dame. 
quite but honestly. I do, think, I do think they're overrated. Um, uh, they got they got to kind of get over that hump for me. They're kind of like another Oklahoma, another team that is is pretty consistent in what they do year in and year out. They don't really mm-hmm. pull the schedule, a quality schedule, or what I would consider a quality schedule. And then when they do face a quality opponent, they get beat. They played Georgia really tight last year, but uh, it shouldn't even been that close. And Georgia prevailed in the end. Um, they haven't won those big games. They have, op- they have an opportunity to do it this weekend, though. I do think if they're going to knock off Clemson, it would be this week without Trevor Lawrence still going to be sitting out. Um, you got a veteran quarterback and Ian Book going against a young freshman who is very talented. But uh, if Notre Dame can do some, do some things to confuse them, they could come out on top. Clemson gets behind like they did against BC. It's going to be a lot harder for them to impose their will in the second half and to rally back. So that'll be something to watch to see what Clemson does the first half of that game. If they come out and drop the ball and give Notre Dame a 14-point lead, it could be trouble. Yeah. Also, I just I really want to thank you for coming on to the channel, man, and uh, speaking Bulldogs news with me. Uh, hopefully we can do it again, maybe post-game. Yeah, man. should be the first of many. Um, I'll give my unbiased opinion each and every time. So if there's any weeks you got a matchup coming up and it's not Georgia on the schedule, I, I mean, I'll give you my take on both teams. I try to be non-biased, I, but I have picked Florida to win in each one of my preview videos. I actually got the Texas A&M. I was one point off of my prediction against Texas A&M, except it was flip-flop. Texas A&M was on top. but uh, So that was unfortunate. But, yeah, I do try to stay biased myself. But once again, thanks for coming on, man. And uh, we'll holler at you next week. Appreciate it, buddy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Take care. Thank you. If you liked today's video, please remember to hit the like button down below, share, and subscribe for all the latest Gator news all year long. From recruiting to matchup previews, post-game highlights, and much more.